So even though I, but I did have sexual relationships, you know, after my injury, I wasn't really ready to have a serious relationship where I could work because you can't expect someone to love you if you don't love yourself. And uh, now I'm glad to say, or happy to say, that I'm in a better place now where I'm a little older, more experienced, and uh, I'm able to enjoy life and, uh, and some of the other sexual parts of it. My experience with uh, um, developing as a sexual person or being, um, you know, it, it, it took a while for me once I got, I got comfortable as, as um, an active sexual person. I put a lot of um, the pressure or the stress of it was my responsibility to initiate conversation, to meet people, to ask questions, to um, nurture a relationship, if you want to put it that way, and develop things. And I think moving on or looking back on those days, um, I put a lot of undue stress on myself. And I, I think developing and maturing, once I realized that I was only responsible for half of the equation um, and that your partner or significant other um, has an equal responsibility in, in whether it be experimenting or intimacy or um, falling in love. Um, that's just part of life and, and uh, I think sometimes people with disabilities um, try to take on more than their share of the, of the responsibility. So um, I, when I look back, I just think that when, as I matured, I felt better about myself when I was uh, an equal partner in the relationship. I'd, I'd like to talk about fear. I think a lot of people that are listening to this webcast are nervous and fearful. I know for myself, uh, first experience, I was just real nervous and feared and, 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 and everything. And, I, and, and talking to Dan before, I think he kind of felt the same way, and I think most guys do. And, and I'd like to just kind of throw it out, is, is what was fearful about the whole process? And, and how was it like the first time and, 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 and that whole going through? Because I know it wasn't, you know, it, perfect. And it kind of had to develop and, and, and progress to the point where you felt comfortable. But in the, in the beginning, was there fear? I, I think that at that time there was, I mean, there's always a certain amount of fear. And, you know, going across the room and asking that girl if she wants to, to for a phone number or something. So the fear is just a part of relationships to a certain extent. But um, I think when fear causes inactivity or gives you a place to hide, you know, whether you're standing up or sitting down, male, female, there's fear in relationships. And I think sometimes a disability gives you poetic license to not stick your neck out and, and not do things. Maybe it gives you a comfort zone of, um, I can't do that. And that's, that's incorrect. You know, um, fear is, is a motivator as opposed to an excuse. So I think that's probably a better way to look at it. I'd like to ask the panel, uh, has your concept of your sexuality changed uh, after your injury? At the end of the day, uh, one thing I did realize is that some of the things that I had done in the past, I needed to change. Not only because of injury, but because I realized a lot that uh, the women I was with were missing out on. And that's just taking your time, taking it slow, maybe enjoying foreplay, not just having it as something you have to do so you can have sex, but something that's totally intimate. And the more that I did that, I realized how much more women enjoyed it. And for me, it, I think that's pretty uh, uh, simplistic way of thinking, but it's something that a lot of us men don't do, and that's before and after injury. So if you kind of take that time with your woman, I think that helps develop the relationship a lot more because you're actually showing her that you appreciate her, you appreciate her beauty, her body, and you're showing it to her instead of it just being about me. Uh, in my rehab, we didn't really receive a lot of information, so I just went out and started asking questions and started gathering as much information, whether it was from the internet, whether it was the need of, to use any type of drugs or any type of prescription uh, drugs to, to help. But after a while, I think it helped me develop uh, into a better person because uh, I kind of saw the things that I was maybe doing wrong 
uh, as a man, as a lover before injury, that I kind of corrected after injury and realized, uh, you know, how I could actually make it better for the woman that I'm with. So I would say my experiences uh, through injury is just about experimenting and, and doing what you want to do, not textbook. I, I agree completely with Chris with what he's saying. Sex for me has changed so much in that, you know, it's more about my partner than it is me. I don't have the ability to climax anymore. And so my goal, and what I, my goal in, uh, in sex is to, is to have my partner climax. And it's more like foreplay now than it ever really is, like when it used to be just sex. And it's a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, but it's funny how you, I, you know, you define sex now, and I define it as foreplay. And when I'm with my friends, you know, my able-bodied friends, they're always like, hey, yo, did you hit that yet? And I'm like, and I'm like, yeah, I did. But I didn't know how to explain it to them, so I just said, yeah, I did. I hit that, you know, and, and then they, they like give me their high five, you know, guys do. And uh, it's, just, it's just, I always found it funny because they don't quite understand, you know, that sex in, in, in our case is, is so much different and for the women so much better, too. Gary Karp uh, had stated it pretty, pretty well in, 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 in saying that uh, if you put your expectations up to where they were prior to your injury, where that, that was what was sex about, and, and if I don't meet those, then you're going to be disappointed. And I think that was a good point that he made. And I think we can't forget about pleasing ourselves, and I think it's, yeah, it's important, yes, we have to please our, our partner, and it's important, but don't forget about yourself as well. You're part of that. It's, it's, it's a two-way street on it. I, I agree with you, Jim. I, I Again, with progression, you know, uh, over 30 years as a person with a disability, I've gone through the initial experimenting. I was uh, the dating scene, you know, a young person, a young professional, um, having a fiancé, being married, um, being intimate as a father, being uh, dealing with fertility. You know, there's a there's a, a progression that you go in as you, as you age. Part of it is getting better in touch with what makes you happy, what satisfies you. So I, I through the years, have have gotten better at, and better understanding of what what I like, what makes me tick, what uh, what my partner likes, and that always changes. And I don't think it has very much to do with my disability. I think it has. Everything to do with me as, as a, uh, a human being and as a sexual person. So, the I, th I, th I would put disability very low on the list, and your your um, personal approach, your self-esteem, and your partner way up on the list. I, I think it's like that with with everything about your life. Your disability becomes less and less and less of an issue, and it drops down lower. In the beginning, it's right up there. And that's the main thing. But uh, after a while, it becomes less and less, and you're dealing with other aspects that are much more important than the disability. Yeah. There's no wheelchairs in the bed, you know? <laughs> I always like to tell people that I'm four foot seven or four foot, four, like, was it four foot four sitting down? But, you know, I'm still six feet tall, and you got to get me down in bed to see that height. And uh, that usually gets a laugh out of some people. As, as a peer coordinator at Mount Sinai, uh, I talk to all of our inpatients that are, are newly injured, and, and, and with a lot of them, the question comes up, uh, what about sex? Will I ever be able to? What's, what's the story with that? And I'd like to ask all of you, you're, you're looking at someone who's just recently injured, and, and they're asking you, hey, come on, give me the insight on what's going on. Is there sex? Can I have sex? What do you tell them? Or what would you like to say to those people out there? I think it's definitely important for you to do your research, but depending on age, if you don't, haven't had a, many sexual relations or you're still trying to develop it, I would say talk to someone who's been injured and ask them about their relations. Because there's some things that textbooks just don't teach you, especially when it comes to in terms of intimacy or pleasing a woman. A textbook's not going to tell you how to do that. It might tell you which drugs you might need to use to help your performance. But go talk to someone that's injured, who's been injured longer than you. And for guys who's already had sexual experiences and now you become injured, I would say just do everything that you were doing before injury. 
You're injured, but you can still do a lot if you put your mind to it. The world's tremendous, you know, so don't limit yourself. I'd have to agree with um, what the guys say. It's uh, life is sweet. You, you got to go out and, and participate. Um, I think that uh, looking back, you can really overthink this. You know, you're, whether you're a, a quad, a para, an older person, a young person, um, sex and sexuality will, will have a part in your future. The people that cared about you and loved you prior to your injury are probably still going to love you after your injury. So um, if anything, I would, I would take it easy on yourself. Um, you know, your, your, your spirit is there, your mind is there, and there's a lot out there for you to enjoy and, and participate in. So don't overthink it, just let it fly and see what happens. I know that I would like to share with anybody watching this uh, that, you know, we were all in the same position that you were in at one time. You know, we all had the same concerns and fears that you're having now. And no matter, you know, how alone you may feel, you're, you're never alone because there's so many of us that have gone through just what you're going through. And there's people out there that you can ask these questions to. There's information on the website, websites or internet if you want to look it into. And at the same time, you know, that fear that you're feeling is natural and I'm just here to tell you that it's going to be uh, life is beautiful, sex is beautiful and all these things are going to happen in due time and uh, it's important that you go out there and ask the right questions to the right people so that you can be more comfortable with it. I would like to thank our panel Peter, uh, Chris, Dan. Uh, if you have any questions or comments please email them to us. The email address is on the website. And also, please view our other modules uh, on health and wellness. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for viewing the webcast. I hope you found the information contained in the webcast helpful and informative to you and your coping with spinal cord injury. I'd like to offer special thanks in closing to the Nielsen Foundation for allowing us to produce this series, the Mount Sinai School of Medicine Department of Rehabilitation staff who were graciously volunteering their time to review and edit and critique the content of each of these webcasts, the Hunter College Center for Interactive Video who actively helped us in the production of each of these webcast series, and finally and most importantly, our participants in each of the webcasts who willingly came and volunteered their stories of success and triumph in the goal of living well, healthy, and um, happy.